want to teach people how to develop a truly Christian worldview. Answers Magazine will include uh, a very unique set of features. Now, Answers Magazine is going to really fill a niche that's never been met. One of our coolest projects is this Answers Magazine. The Lord has brought such talent that we're bringing together to produce a magazine like no other. We took a survey of a thousand people, which 400 people of our audience responded to, and we decided to put their information into this magazine so it's directly reflecting what they're wanting. We were able to put together uh, what we believe to be a plan to produce a magazine called Answers that has some of the traditional creation evolution uh, articles and so on, but also has many other features that will appeal to a wider variety of people. Mom wants more information that she can use with her young people in a homeschool setting. Dad wants more information that he can use with his entire family. People wanted more than just creation articles. They wanted more worldview, especially biblical worldview. Answers Magazine goes far beyond the creation evolution debate. It takes a look at the root of the real issues. This new magazine helps Christians to be able to defend their faith in a society that's becoming more secular each day. Most importantly, it helps families develop a biblical worldview, starting with the Bible's very first verse. Packed with colorful photographs and eye-catching illustrations, this quarterly publication contains compelling articles, pull-out charts, and practical tips on culturally relevant topics. Children will love this special pull-out Kids Answers section that includes fun-filled activities, articles, plus a collectible poster. AnswersMagazine.com is the perfect companion to the magazine, offering additional bonus material such as in-depth articles, children's games, and timely updates to articles and events. It's really going to communicate just the whole view, the whole landscape of what's going on in American culture today. We want to put together a periodical that will come alongside mom and dad, reinforce the faith of their young people, reinforce the faith of mom and dad at the same time. Give people answers, equip people with answers so we can engage the culture, engage the church, and see the gospel proclaimed. Welcome to A Day of Creationism from the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, featuring Ken Ham with Answers in Genesis Ministries. And now the conference host, Dr. Jerry Falwell. This is session three of an all-day five-session uh, day of creationism here at the Thomas Road Baptist Church, Lynchburg, Virginia. Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis is our teacher. And in this third session, he is talking about what the Bible has to say about dinosaurs. Call all the children now on the phone. This is a great time for everyone to learn about dinosaurs and what happened to them. Well, buddy, uh, what have you got here? I've got my uh, pet dinosaur right here, Ken. This is a baby T-Rex. It's a T-Rex? Mm -hmm. Ah, can you hear me? Yeah, he can hear you. Okay, T-Rex, uh, what's his name? Levi. Levi, Levi. Levi, do you believe in millions of years? No, obviously. Yeah. Not in praying, do I not? Yeah. Do you think Buddy Davis is millions of years old? Hey, yeah, I, <laughs> I agree with that too. <laughs> uh, Levi, did dinosaurs die out millions of years ago? Did they die out millions of years ago? No, they didn't. Well, Buddy, how about we uh, have a fun time talking about some dinosaurs? You, you sculpted this dinosaur, didn't you? Well, I helped sculpt. Yeah, it looks like a real one, doesn't it? Fantastic. Dinosaurs, one of my favorite topics, and that's what we're going to talk about. A lot of people ask, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And one of the things I want to say to you is this. Do you know how you fit dinosaurs? Who would like to know how you fit dinosaurs in the Bible? Would you like to know how you fit dinosaurs in the Bible? Okay, here's the answer. You don't. 
they say, what, what do you mean? Don't you believe in dinosaurs? Of course I believe in dinosaurs. Buddy sculpted these dinosaurs you see up here uh, with me based on bones that we find and so on. Of course I believe in dinosaurs. But you know the problem? You know why Christians don't have answers to things like dinosaurs? You know, because they're trying to fit dinosaurs into the Bible. They say, how do you fit the World Trade Center bombings into the Bible? How do you fit the Grand Canyon into the Bible? How do you fit fossils into the Bible? See, the point is you don't fit those things into the Bible. You don't take man's interpretation of the evidence in the present and try to fit it into the Bible. You use the Bible as a history book to explain dinosaurs. And that's what I want to do with you. I want us to take the Bible as a revealed word of God, what it claims to be. In fact, I call the Bible the history book of the universe. And we're going to go through that history step by step. And then we're going to show you how you take that history as a pair of glasses. Remember we talked about those glasses in the first session? Put those glasses on, go out and apply the history that encompasses geology, biology, astronomy, etc. See, the Bible gives you the big picture of history so you can go out and apply it to the evidence of the present and we can explain dinosaurs and use real science in the present to confirm that the biblical glasses are correct. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? It, it, it really is. Well the Bible says that uh, God created a perfect creation. He created in six days as we've talked about and he said that everything he created was very good. Then of course we know that sin and death entered as a result of uh, Adam's rebellion and then we have an event called the catastrophe of Noah's flood and a great geological event, animals were on board that boat, every kind of land animal. By the way, were dinosaurs included? We're going to find out if dinosaurs were included. Because my Bible in Genesis 6 says two of every kind, seven of some, except the dinosaurs went on board. Doesn't your Bible say that? <laughs> Not at all. And then we learn that there was confusion at the time of the Tower of Babel. God gave different languages. People split up, moved out over the earth. By the way, you know what people did as they moved around the earth? They drew pictures of animals that they lived with. And we find cave drawings and cave drawings that look like dinosaurs. Well, we'll find out about that too. And then, of course, Jesus Christ steps into that history to die on a cross, be raised from the dead. And one day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth to come. And so what I want to do is to take that history, put on those glasses and show you how we can make sense of dinosaurs. Boy, what a difference it makes when you work from the Bible to the world instead of trying to fit the world into the Bible. What a difference it makes. Then you've got answers and you can use real science to defend what the Bible is teaching. Well, the Bible says that God made everything in six days. He tells us what he did on each of the days. And on day six, he made the land animals and he made Adam and Eve. And you'll notice that one of the land animals we have pictured on day six happens to look like, whoop, what kind of animal does it happen to look like? It looks like a dinosaur, doesn't it? Did God make dinosaurs on day six? You know, it's interesting. I, I was at a church in Florida, actually, and I said to them, I said, does God tell us when he made Tyrannosaurus rex? And they said, no. I said, okay. Okay, let's think, think through this for a moment. Does God tell us uh, any, anything about T-Rex? No, no. I said, okay. Was T-Rex a land animal? Yes, they said T-Rex was a land animal. Okay, T-Rex was a land animal. Uh, were land animals made on day six? Yes, land animals were made on day six. I said, okay. So when was T-Rex created? And they said, land animals on day six. T-Rex, oh yeah, day six. <laughs> See, the Bible is not a science textbook, right? I had, I had a university student once yell out to me and he said, he said, but the Bible's not a science textbook. And I said, you're right, and I'm glad about that because science textbooks change every year. But <laughs> the Bible doesn't change. If, if the Bible was a science textbook, we'd be in trouble. But where the Bible touches on science, can we trust it? And the answer is yes. See, the Bible gives us the big picture. It doesn't name all the land animals and, 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 and give all their names that we have today or anything like that. But it gives us the big picture of history to understand the real world. And so if God made land animals on day six and those days are ordinary days, guess what? I'm going to stand up in the culture and authoritatively say dinosaurs live with people. Now I'll be mocked at for saying that and a lot of people don't want to say that. We don't want to be scoffed at, do we? But you know something? If that word for day means an ordinary day and I'm going to take God's word as written, I don't care what the world says, I'm prepared to stand on the authority of the word of God and I know ultimately nothing in science will contradict it because it is God's word and that's what we find. By the way, I can prove to you dinosaurs lived on the same day as Adam anyway because I have a photograph that Eve took in the Garden of Eden and there you can see uh, Adam and living, you know, the kangaroo and so on living beside uh, T-Rex. Actually that's a picture I believe from scripture that dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. Of course when I teach children, a lot of children say, but sir, I I've had people tell me dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. You know what you do when someone says that? You learn the lesson from Job. In Job chapter 38 and four, verse 4, one of my favorite passages of the Bible, you know what God said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, I say to children, the next time somebody says millions of years ago, put your hand up 
and ask this question, excuse me, were you there? <laughs> Because I've had them come back to me and say, Mr. Ham, we asked the evolutionists, were you there? And they said, no, we weren't, but you weren't either. What do we say now? I said, oh, it's simple. You know what you say now? You say, no, I wasn't there, but I know someone who was, and I have his word. Would you like to read it? Because <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Where do you put your faith and trust? In the words of men who don't know everything, who weren't there, who are sinful creatures, whose theories change every day, or the word of God who's always been there, whose word changeth not? Where would you like to put your faith and trust? Because then people say to me, but wait a minute, the word dinosaur is not in the Bible. Well, that's true, but neither is the word email. It's not in the Bible either, right? And anyone who has email knows it came after the curse, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Poodles and email, same sort of thing. You know what I mean. But, but you see, the word dinosaur was first invented in 1841. It was invented by a very famous man. If you go to the British Museum of Natural History in London, you'll see there a statue dedicated to Richard Owen, who was the first director of the museum. And Richard Owen invented the name dinosaur from two Greek words, dinosauria. He had the bones of a couple of creatures, he guanted on a megalosaurus, and he wanted a name for those bones to describe these creatures that he hadn't found before. And so he invented the name dinosaur, which means terrible monster or great big lizard, if you like. See, if you think about it, the King James Bible was first translated into English in 1611, and the edition we use today, I think, 1769 edition, something like that. But see, the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. So you certainly wouldn't find the word dinosaur in the King James Bible. But you know something? I'm disappointed it's not in some of the other translations, more modern translations. I suspect the translators, modern translators, are influenced like everybody else with millions of years and evolution and so on. But you know, even though the word dinosaur itself is a modern word, I think there is an old word that means the same. If you have a look up here on, on the stage, you'll see Buddy has done a dragon. Aren't there dragon legends all over the world? There are, aren't there? Fire-breathing dragons like St. George and the Dragon. If you go to one of the big museums in London, you see a plaque there about a sculpture that was done in the, in the 1500s. It's a sculpture of St. George and the Dragon. And as you travel around England, you see dragon carvings everywhere. In fact, these are some famous dragon heads that you see in a certain place in England. In fact, if you go to the country of Wales, you know the national emblem on the flag of Wales? It happens to be a what? Dragon. Now, I have people say to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. Aren't they just mythical stories, mystical stories, and all the rest of it? Dragon legends? You, you believe in dragons? Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know there are flood legends in cultures all over the world? The Australian Aborigines, the Fijians, the Hawaiians, the Eskimos, back to Babylonians and so on, they have stories that sound like Genesis 1 to 11. It's remarkable. The Aborigines had these stories before they met missionaries about a global flood, about three suns on a boat. The boat lands on a mountain after this flood that covered the earth and, and God put a rainbow in the sky to tell them what the weather would be like. <laughs> you heard a story something like that? And you, you know, you, ha you have these stories all over the world. You know why? Why is it that they, they, so many of them have elements just like the Bible? Well, the reason to me is obvious, because they're all descendants of Noah. And those, those uh, particular legends have been handed down, they've been changed, but there's still elements there the same, and that's why we have flood legends all over the world. You know what, friends? We have dragon legends all over the world. You know why I believe we do? Because there's a basis in something real. They might have embellished some of the stories, but there has to be something real. There are, there are dragon carvings all over the world. In fact, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the word for dragon in the Hebrew, uh, tannin occurs a number of times and if you replace it with dinosaur, it actually fits quite nicely in most instances. Now, in, in some of the modern translations, you won't find the word dragon. For instance, in the book of Isaiah, I know you say Isaiah in America, but that's incorrect. The I is in the middle. It's Isaiah. Uh, you can see there, <laughs> have to pronounce things the Australian way, right? There's the word dragon that you can see there. Well, in some modern translations, it puts jackal. i got news for you. It's not the word for jackal. <laughs> They've just imposed a modern animal on there, not knowing what it was. I think these could be the dinosaurs that we talk about. Even in Jeremiah 14, it talks about dragons as well. See, what a difference it makes when you start from the Bible and move out to the world and try to take off the world's glasses. You see things differently, don't you? Instead of starting from the world's idea of millions of years and so on and then going to the Bible, you would never see these sorts of things. See, that's why we need to start from the Bible. And so I believe that the dragons of old 
could be what we call dinosaurs today. And that's why we had Buddy uh, for our Creation Museum. As you can see, he sculpted a dinosaur. And that dinosaur he sculpted, by the way, is actually based upon the, 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 the dragon he, uh, he sculpted is based upon the dinosaur Baryonyx. Just to show you how people could describe creatures and embellish the story a bit over the years, things like that. Do you know the Bible doesn't only talk about land dragons? Do you know what else the Bible talks about? It talks about the dragon that is in the sea. In fact, it has a name, Leviathan. You know where Leviathan is described in detail? In Job chapter 41. Leviathan is a great big dragon that lives in the sea. By the way, that one happens to be a fire-breathing dragon. And people say, ah, oh, there weren't any fire-breathing dragons. Do you know what some theologians have said? Well, obviously here in Job it's talking about a, 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 mythic, a mystical creature. You know, it's just obviously mythology. <laughs> you know when you read Job 38, 39, 40, you, you know what you read there? Job, look at this animal and this one, and look at this animal, Job, and what does this animal do, Job? And you know about this animal, they're all animals that we understand, they're all real, and Job 41, suddenly it's a myth. Does that make sense? Not at all. No, I believe Leviathan was a real animal. And of course, in the Psalms, we read about, again, the dragons that are in the waters. Hey, if there are dragons in the waters, why couldn't they be something like the, the great Cronosaurus we find bones of in Queensland, Australia? Or how about the Plesiosaur? I'm sure you've all heard of the Plesiosaur. But then there's another interesting passage in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, again. And notice what it says here. In the book of Isaiah, there's a flying serpent. Do you know there are creatures, or bones of creatures, we find, that scientists today refer to as flying serpents? In fact, there's one up here, as you can see on my left. It's a, it's a pterodactyl. That's really a flying serpent. Some of you might have heard of the Rampharynchus, might have heard of the Pteranodon. We had Buddy make a pterodactyl for our Creation Museum uh, that we're building. So you see, I, I don't see why the Bible might not be talking about those creatures. Why not? If you start from the Bible, it gives you a whole different perspective at looking at the world. And we're going to test this with real science as we go on here a little later, see if this makes sense. By the way, I do want to get rid of a misconception. A lot of people think that all dinosaurs were big, like T-Rex. You see this uh, T-Rex here. This is a head that Buddy has sculpted. He's quite a sculptor, isn't he? And right now, he just finished, I'll show you this under construction, he just finished putting that head on a T-Rex model for our museum, 40 feet long, 14 feet high. I mean, it's an enormous, uh, enormous dinosaur. It's now finished, and it just... It, I've, been, I've been to some of the best museums in the world, and I've never seen dinosaur models as good as what Buddy has built. And, and we praise the Lord for that. Here he is with his stegosaur. I really like the stegosaur, too. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Here are some of the other dinosaurs that Buddy has sculpted that are going to be in our Creation Museum. Uh, but see, I put these up for a particular reason. Do you know that most dinosaurs, from all the skeletons we find, the average size of a dinosaur is only the size of a sheep? Did you know that? That's true. Even though some dinosaurs were big, the average size is only the size of a sheep. So don't get the idea that all dinosaurs are big. But these dinosaurs are going to go in our Creation Museum that we're building in the greater Cincinnati area. We hope to open it in 2004. We're praying the Lord will provide the funds for that so we can do that. And we've already started doing the excavation. Humanists have been trying to close us down to stop it. We even had a court case. It's been a long story. If you look up our website, you'll read that story of intrigue. It's been in newspapers all over the world, actually. It's going to be a 95,000 square foot facility. You know what's going to happen? People are going to come in. We're going to use Buddy's dinosaurs. We have millions of dollars worth of exhibits we obtained from a museum in Baltimore, actually. We have an exhibit designer. He called us up and he said, I, I was uh, head, head up the design of uh, the Jaws. Uh, exhibit in the King Kong exhibit for Universal Studios, but I'm a Christian, I'm a creationist, can I please come work for you and design your exhibits uh, for the Creation Museum? Uh, so the Lord's given us, given us some wonderful talent, and people are going to come into this museum, they're going to walk through the history of the world from the Bible. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, uh, confusion, Christ, cross consummation. We're going to use geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology, the dinosaurs, DNA exhibits, so on, to show that the Bible's history is true, answer the questions of the world, like how did Noah fit the animals on the ark, where did God come from, and, and what about uh, the fossils and the Grand Canyon, and so on. Present the gospel based in real history and tell people and tell the world the Bible's true and you need to bow and kneel to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, what a difference I think that might make in people's lives. It's about time we had, had something like that uh, in this nation. And uh, I would encourage you, encourage you to be praying for that because I believe, you know what, the world's media is interested in this. They are. We've had 
the world's leading media, whether it's CNN, Fox News, whoever, they've all said, we want to be there when it opens because they see this as confronting the culture. Wow, what a way to make an issue of the Christian message in this culture. That's why I'd love to get this thing up tomorrow. <laughs> so if you want to write a check out for $10 million, we'll do it, okay, and, and get it up tomorrow. But anyway, you can be praying for that. By the way, did you know that many dinosaurs were as small as chickens? That's true. If they had survived to today, we would have had Kentucky Fried Dinosaur instead of Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Then people say to me, now wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying that T-Rex lived beside Adam, that's right. T-Rex with all those sharp teeth, that's right. Don't you think that um, Adam would have been a little worried when T-Rex was looking at the, the lunch menu? Because what did T-Rex eat? Some people say, well, anything he wanted to eat. Well, no, that's not true. Actually, if you read the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, God told Adam and Eve to eat fruit, and he told the animals to eat plants. In fact, we weren't told to eat meat until after the flood. So you see, originally, if we take God at his word, when T-Rex was considering lunch, he was considering fruits and vegetables and plants and so on. You see, man wasn't told to eat meat until after the flood. And again, I want to emphasize what I said in the other session. Biblical history teaches us very plainly, death, bloodshed, disease, and suffering is a consequence of sin. See, as soon as you believe in millions of years, you've got all that death and bloodshed and disease, dinosaur bones with evidence of cancer before sin. No, the Bible makes it clear, death came after sin. So you see, you can't marry those two together and be consistent as a Christian. You can try, but you're not consistent, and you undermine biblical authority, and you undermine the gospel. So originally, the diet of Adam and Eve, the animals, was something like that. Doesn't that look nice? Yeah, it's because it's from Australia, that's why it looks so nice. <laughs> But then I have people who say to me, wait a minute, wait a minute, Ken Ham, are you saying that T-Rex with all those sharp teeth like that, are you saying that T-Rex was a vegetarian originally? But he's obviously a meat eater, he has sharp teeth. Look, just because an animal has sharp teeth doesn't mean he's a meat eater, it just means he has sharp teeth. Isn't that right? <laughs> and by the way, there are certain vegetables you need sharp teeth to eat. Or if you go to a restaurant in America and you're served cantaloupe, you need sharp teeth to eat it. Because mostly what I've served was uh, never ripened on the vine anyway. And you know what it's like. It's green and you've got to chew on it for an hour to swallow it. But do you know there's a lot of animals today that have sharp teeth that are basically vegetarian? I remember going to the San Diego Zoo once with five million people on the, on the same day. And, and we lined up, you know, like going to Disneyland, have three rides and go home, have a great time. But uh, we lined up and we finally got to the, to the exhibit. And, and you know what the, <laughs> the, the guide said? Do you realize the panda evolved by evolution to get sharp teeth so it could eat meat, so now it can eat bamboo? I looked at my children and said, I think it's designed to do what it does do, and what it does do, it does do very well, doesn't it? Don't you think? They thought it did. I did too. Hope you do. We have a great time as we talked about uh, the panda. By the way, when I was in Australia last year, I went to the Taronga Park Zoo, another famous zoo, and on the bear exhibit they had this sign. Although all bears have teeth designed for eating meat, their diet consists mainly of plants. <laughs> Interesting statement, isn't it? <laughs> Did you know that most bears, that their teeth look like the teeth of a lion or a tiger, but most of them are vegetarian, or primarily vegetarian. See, just because an animal ha has sharp teeth doesn't mean it's a meat eater, it means it has what? Sharp teeth. In fact, here's uh, a picture of an interesting creature from South America, and you look at that and say, man, that must be a savage meat eater. Actually, it's a vegetarian. Eats leaves and, and, and uh, other plant material like that. This is an interesting quote from the Life Nature Library says, the oddest inhabitants of the Galapagos coastlines, marine iguanas which exist nowhere else in the world, like miniature dinosaurs, the inky armored lizards swarm over the rocky shores of the islands. When upset, they squirt vapor from their nostrils like storybook dragons. Despite their ferocious appearance, the sea iguanas are strict and docile vegetarians, completely harmless, gregarious to an extreme. Though armed with strong claws and sharp teeth, they rarely use them on each other and never attack other animals. Interesting quote, isn't it? So you see, originally, it was a perfect world. Adam and Eve and the dinosaurs all living happily together. Dinosaurs living happily together. Maybe you could ride a dinosaur around the garden like uh, a Buddy Davis, right? Although that's a, that's a post-fall photo because he has clothes on, but I couldn't show you a pre-fall photo with a post-fall audience. You, you understand that, right? <laughs> See, I just want to make the point, things have changed since sin, okay? But today we know that you know, people eat animals, animals eat each other, animals even eat people and so on. And you know what I say to children? We have to ask a question. You know what the question is? What happened? What happened? 
And here's where when I'm talking to children, I have a special presentation I do on children, which is sort of like this, but it's, it's a little different because we have fun together and Buddy comes out and sings songs and we do all sorts of wonderful things together for kids. We have a great time. Uh, I, I love kids and so does Buddy. We've we, we got five kids actually, four Australians and one American. So uh, I understand different cultures and things like that. And, but although most of our kids have been brought up in America now, so they think American and it's pretty sad really. But, uh, but anyway... <laughs> But you know, when I'm talking to children and I ask that question, what happened? Then I say, I want everybody perfectly quiet. Shh. The saddest day in the history of the universe. Adam took the fruit. He really said, and we said in Adam, we don't want God. We want life without God. Adam rebelled. Do you realize that that event affected everything? It affected the dirt. It affected people. It affected the animals. It affected the sun, moon, and stars. It affected the universe. It affected dinosaurs. It affected everything. See, that's what Paul says in Romans 8, doesn't he? The whole of creation grows. By the way, if you believe in millions of years, what did that event do? Nothing. This has gone on for millions of years. See how important it is to believe the biblical history? Adam sinned. By one man, sin into the world and death by sin. That's why Paul says the whole of creation groans and travaileth in pain. The whole of creation. Well, things changed. After the flood, dinosaurs, well, I think, actually, not just after the flood. After the fall, dinosaurs had a different diet. Now, after the flood was the first time man was told he could eat meat, right? But we actually find bones of animals, fossils, and, and some of their stomach contents in the fossil record with bones of other animals in them. You know what it reminds me of? At the time of the flood, you know what it says in the Bible? All flesh was violent. I suspect animals were eating each other. Maybe some people were eating, eating animals too. But I think Noah was a vegetarian. You know why? The Bible says Noah obeyed God. And man wasn't told to eat meat until after the flood for the first time. But things changed because of sin. In fact, so much so, the whole world was so, so wicked, so violent, God said, enough! I'm going to send a flood. And he told a man called Noah to build a boat. He told him how big that boat was to be, how long, about 437 feet long and about 73 feet wide, about 40 feet, 4 feet high. It was an enormous boat. And God said to Noah, I'm going to send you two of every, seven of some, but two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal to go on board the ark. By the way, Noah didn't have to go out to collect them. Some people say, well, how did the kangaroos get from Australia? Well, I've got some sad news. I don't think Australia existed before the flood. Actually, I don't think America existed before the flood. <laughs> I don't think Japan existed before the flood. See, you know, before evolutionists ever thought of the idea, you know what creationists have been saying for years, for generations? Hey, Genesis 1 says, on day 3, when God made the dry land appear, he gathered the waters together into one place, and they say this, this implies that the land was in one place. We think there was one major continent. And it split up during the flood. Not in the days of Peleg, by the way, because that's in Genesis 10. That's, a, that's the context of the, of, of the nations that split up according to language. If that was a split up of the continents, you'd have Noah's flood all over again. <laughs> a catastrophe like that. No, the split up occurred during the flood. Now, by the way, I would also say the mountains weren't as high or the ocean basins weren't as deep at the time of the flood. You have fossil layers on the top of Mount Everest. But if you level out all the ocean basins and the mountains, there's enough water to cover to a depth of two miles. There's plenty of water on the earth. Psalm 104 seems to indicate how God entered the flood. Mountains rose, valleys sank, the water poured off. Most of the earth is still covered from the waters of the flood, actually, when you look at it. So God chose the animals to go to Noah, two of every kind, uh, seven of some, uh, two of the unclean, as you know. How many dogs were on Noah's Ark? They needed two. How many elephants? Two. How many of the, the sheep kind would be on Noah's Ark? Seven. You, see, you get the idea? Plenty of room on Noah's Ark, as I said in one of the earlier sessions, about 16,000 individual animals. Because a lot of people think there's no way dinosaurs could go on the Ark because there's no way that Adam could push that dinosaur into the Ark. It's too big. But actually, what did I tell you? The average size of a dinosaur was what? Size of a sheep. That's right, the average size. Now, some dinosaurs are big, but let me talk about dinosaur eggs. And I want Buddy to hold up my, an egg here for you. We have a real dinosaur egg here. You see, dinosaur eggs, some of them were large, some are small. This is one of the large ones. This is actually a T. rex egg. In fact, this is actually the real fossil. This is not even a mold. In fact, this is a very, very valuable fossil. 
and have to be very careful with it. But this is a T-Rex egg. You see, it's what a bit, bit bigger than the size of a football. So even a T-Rex, thanks, buddy. Even a T-Rex, when he hatched out of an egg, wouldn't be that big, would he? Uh, when, there's even some dinosaurs that when they hatched out of dinosaur eggs were about the size of mice. That's a mosasaurus when they first hatched out. So even a stegosaur, when a stegosaur hatched out of an egg, wouldn't be that big. Now, I don't believe Noah took babies on board or anything like that. I think maybe some, one of the reasons that some dinosaurs were big, they might be, just might have been very old dinosaurs, that's possible. Most of them were not big anyway. As I said, the average size is only the size of a sheep. But I suspect God would, would choose young adults for the new world. I don't think he'd choose senior citizens to populate a new world, do you? I think he'd choose young adults uh, for the new world. But then people say to me, but wait a minute, wait a minute, there are over 600 names of dinosaurs, aren't there? You know, Parasaurolophus, Pachycephalosaurus, Judimamus, Cytocosaurus, Tenostrophus, Allosaurus, Supersaurus, Brontosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, I mean, all those sorts of dinosaurs. Well, remember something. Aren't there lots of different names for dogs? Isn't that right? We have all these different dogs, all these different names of dogs, and we have different names for horses as well. Do you know how many horses Noah needed on the ark? Only two. Do you know how many dogs Noah needed on the ark? Only two. They're just all varieties of horses and varieties of dogs. Now with dinosaurs, there's not just one kind of dinosaur, but here's the point. There are many names that are probably the Triceratops kind. There are many names that are probably the T-Rex kind. There are many names that might be the Velociraptor kind. There are many names that might be the sauropod kind. You get the idea? In fact, we've been very liberal here and say there would have been only 50 kinds of dinosaurs, maybe even less than 50, but at the most, 50 actual kinds that were needed on the ark. Remember, a lot of those names are just given to the same dinosaurs uh, from different countries or the different sizes or fragments of bones of, of a slightly different variety or something like that. Well, I believe that dinosaurs are on board Noah's ark. How often do you see children's books in Christian bookshops with dinosaurs going on the ark? You don't, do you? Not very often. You do with our books, by the way. Usually you see Noah's ark pictured in children's books today looking like an overloaded bathtub with giraffes sticking out the chimney about to sink at any moment. Aren't they cute little pictures? Actually, if you invite me to your church and I find them on your kindergarten wall, I'm likely to rip them off. Sorry about that, but... <laughs> You see, you know why? The world scoffs at those of us who believe in Noah's Ark, doesn't it? The world scoffs at Noah's flood. The world doesn't want to believe there was a judgment. They don't want to believe that that happened. Why help them scoff by making Noah's Ark look like a fairy tale? See, kids know. That Ark there, there's no way the animals could fit on it. By the way, this Ark here, drawn to scale, that could fit all the animals on board. This Ark here, this bathtub Ark, that wouldn't survive a global flood. This Ark here, the real one based upon the Bible, that would survive a global flood. Here's the Noah's Ark model we have constructed for our creation museum. A man spent 400 hours constructing that to scale. In fact, if you look closely, you can see the animals, you can see dinosaurs and people on top of that. Uh, I had Buddy draw me a picture of Noah's Ark to scale with dinosaur and, and man, a medium-sized dinosaur and man for scale. There's plenty of room on Noah's Ark. There's plenty of room on Noah's Ark. By the way, there was even room for people. You know what hit me? Do you know something else? Not only should we not make Noah's Ark look like a fairy tale, but there's something else about Noah's Ark that's very special. Did you know that Noah's Ark is a picture of salvation, a picture of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine, it says in the Bible that, that in the New Testament, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And I can imagine on the last seven days, when the door was still open, can you imagine Noah out there? Come through the doorway to be saved. You need to come through the doorway to be saved. There's a flood coming. You know what people said? Oh, God's word's not true. There's no flood coming. We don't believe God's word. You know what happened? The door shut. God's word is true. The Bible says just as there's been a flood as a judgment, there's going to be another judgment, but not by water next time. By what? Fire. And just as surely as God sent the flood as a judgment, just as surely there's going to be final judgment. And you say, how can I escape the final judgment to come? You know what Jesus Christ said? I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he will be saved. You see, God's provided an ark of salvation for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to go through that doorway to be saved. Noah's ark is a picture of Jesus. Friends, don't make Noah's ark look like a fairy tale. Make it look like the real boat. So kids can look at it and say, wow, that was real. Wow, it was a real event in history. Wow, there was a real judgment. Wow, it reminds me of sin. It reminds me of wickedness. It reminds me of salvation. It reminds me of who I am. I want to be in the ark, not outside the ark. Wow, what a wonderful message we have.
for the world. Well, the Bible tells us the fountains of the deep broke open all over the earth. There were tidal waves, earthquakes. Only those animals, including dinosaurs that were on Noah's Ark, were safe. Those outside the ark, what happened to them? Well, they drowned <laughs> and covered with mud and turned into fossils. <laughs> and what do we end up with? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. <laughs> oh, by the way, Buddy has a song. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. You know, people sometimes think that I get my sayings from his songs, and I, and he tells, and I and I tell people, no, the songs came from my sayings, and then he tells people the sayings. So anyway, we have a great, we have fun out the front here because we do all this together. Actually, we have great fun about this. But you're going to hear that song at the end of this session. And by the way, when he sings that song. Once you've heard it, you'll never forget it. You'll never sleep again. Uh, you'll be laying awake at night thinking billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. By the way, you know what the evolutionists say? There's no evidence for a global flood. Where's the evidence for a global flood? All you find are billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. There's no evidence for a global flood. You know what you do find, by the way? You find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Hey, you know what? If you look at that picture, I deliberately put some human feet there. You know why? to remind us how serious an event that was because many humans did not survive. In fact, only eight did survive the flood. Not many believe God's word. You know the sad thing? There's fewer people in America today believe God's word. You know why? Because we have put the word of man first instead of the word of God. Well, again, if you can't have death before sin, you can't have fossils before sin. So you see, Noah's flood makes sense of most of your fossil record. You know what I think most of your fossil record is? I think most of your fossil record is the graveyard of the flood. And it's crying out to the world. God judged sin with death. He judged the wickedness of man. You need to go through a doorway to be saved. That's the message of the fossil record. Now let's consider a few other things here. You see, there's some intriguing evidence that dinosaur bones can't be millions of years old. Here's a fascinating picture. Let's have a look at this. Why don't you look at that picture and let's focus on that section in the middle. You know what we see there? You know what they are? They're red blood cells. Red blood cells found in a T-Rex bone in Montana documented by secular scientists. How, how could that be if that T-Rex bone is 65 million years old, red blood cells aren't going to last that long? Intriguing information, isn't it? And you know, today, because some people have challenged those secular scientists, they don't like us talking about this, they're trying to get out of it in some way, they can't get out of it. They try to, but they can't. Because you know what, they've got on those glasses that say, well, it is 65 million years old, therefore, these are either not red blood cells, or they're this, or they're that, but they are red blood cells. So they say, well, well, well they do last that long. <laughs> Come up with any story when you won't take your glasses off and put on different glasses. Well, if dinosaurs went on the ark, they came off the ark after the flood. All lined up to have their photographs taken. And like typical American entrepreneurs, they sold t-shirts, I survived the flood. <laughs> Anything that happens in America, you make a t-shirt, isn't that right? <laughs> now, I've had people say to me, okay, okay, look, um, Mr. Ham, is, is there anything in the Bible, though, you talked about dragons and so on, is there anything in the Bible that mentions dinosaurs after the flood? Oh, I think there is. Have you ever read the book of Job? In the book of Job, in Job chapter 40, verse 15, there's a creature called behemoth. The Hebrew word means large quadruped. And it means a, a big animal on four legs. As you read the description of, the, of that particular creature, its bones are big, its body is big. I mean, everything about that creature is big. And it has an enormous tail as well. In fact, it's the chief in the ways of God, which means the largest land animal God made. That's what verse 19 really means. And he moves his tail like a cedar, an enormous tail. Now, if you've got an NIV Bible, for instance, if you look in the notes at the bottom, you know what it says? This was an elephant or a hippopotamus. Have a look at that description. Now, I spent all day at the zoo once getting a picture of the rear end of an elephant. There we are. Uh, in fact, let me just focus upon that. There it is right there. Looks like a cedar tree to me. Does it look like a cedar tree to you? Behold, behemoth. I don't think so. What about a hippopotamus? Okay, let's have a look at the hippo. By the way, that was a very embarrassing photograph to get. I want you to know what I do for people. I mean, I was in the nat... See, I've been out to the zoo since then. I cannot get the hippopotamus to turn around. So I was at the Natural History Museum in London, 
and I, and I bent over this fence to sort of get around this display where you weren't allowed to be, sort of stretching out behind the hippopotamus, trying to get a photograph of its rear end to get its tail, and all these school kids walking past, and one of them yells out, that man's sick. <laughs> I mean, they come up to me and they said, what are you doing? I said, well, its tail is like a cedar, I'm getting a picture. Then they thought I was nuts. <laughs> Look, here's a tail to me that looks like a cedar tree. Let's back it onto an elephant and say, I don't think so. How about we back it onto a, a hippo? No, I don't think so. Hey, why couldn't behemoth be a dinosaur? Why not? Well, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Excuse me, were you there? Well, if dinosaurs lived after the flood, wouldn't we expect to find some evidence that dinosaurs lived after the flood, maybe? Hmm, I think we do, actually. Because you know something else that happened? Uh, after the flood, and that was a, a number of years later, of course, people rebelled against God again in a big way. They built a tower to worship the heavens instead of worshiping the God who made the heavens. And God gave different languages, and they split up and moved out all over the earth. Do you know what people did as they moved around the world? They made carvings, they made pictures of the animals that they, that they saw. And, you know, that's true of the American Indians, isn't it? I want to show you some fascinating material here. In fact, I'm going to ask Buddy to come out in a second and, and, and show you a piece of cloth here that I think is very important. It goes along with this. Here's a quote from an evolutionist. And the evolutionist said this, There's a petroglyph in National Bridges National Monument, that's in Utah, that bears striking resemblance to a, oh, what's that next word? Dinosaur. Now, by the way, this is not unique to Utah. These sorts of things that I'm going to show you in a moment are all over the world. It's just most people don't hear about them because... because the world doesn't want you to hear about them. That's basically it. But if you go and talk to some of the professors at universities, they know they're there. They're just perplexing. They don't know what to do with them. Now, we sent Buddy out there to Utah, and we sent him out there to have a look at this particular carving that was referred to by the evolutionist, and I want you to look there inside that circle. Now, if you can uh, see here very carefully, can you see the head up there and the tail, uh, the, the body, and going down to the tail there? Can you see that, the body, and up there the head? What does it look like to you? Hmm, looks like a dinosaur to me. In fact, uh, we made a, a wax cloth impression of that. Buddy, do you have that here? This is the actual size. And Buddy was out there and, and they did this while they were, they were out there. Uh, can you see that? What's it look like to you? Does it look like a dinosaur to you? Yeah, it looks like a dinosaur, doesn't it? You know what's fascinating to me? I'll tell you what's fascinating. You go out there and you talk to the park rangers and you say, because there's lots of other carvings right there beside this one. What is this one? Dog. What's this one? Man. What's this one? Deer. What's this one? Bird. What's this one over here? We don't know. <laughs> they call it a mystical creature. Why couldn't there be a dinosaur? Oh no, it's not a dinosaur. Why? Indians didn't see dinosaurs. Excuse me, were you there? How do you know Indians didn't see dinosaurs? Now, there's another one out there that Buddy went and photographed for me too. This is, uh, can you see that? It's very light, isn't it? But you can see it's, it's eroded away. But if we fill it in uh, just with some chalk or whatever, that's what it looks like. But you can see that one there as well. Now, there's something else that's fascinating. Remember I mentioned to you about pterodactyls earlier, about maybe being the flying serpents? Okay. Well, out of Black Dragon Canyon in Utah, and Buddy went out there as well and saw this one, the Indians have drawn a painting of a creature that has a crest on its head. It's got a lump on its head. It has webbed feet, big wingspan, doesn't have feathers. See, they didn't draw it with feathers. They drew it like this. Well, if you have a look at that pterodactyl, what do you notice? It has a crest on its head. And from the footprints they made, some of them had webbed feet. You know what I'm suggesting to you? By the way, not far from there, you do find bones of pterodactyls. I think the Indians saw the bones flying around with flesh and hair on them, of course. You understand that, right? See, if you start with the Bible and go, go to the world, you start saying, wow. This makes sense. The dragon legends, the red blood cells and the T-Rex bone, the, the pictographs, the paintings the Indians have drawn. Yeah, it, it all makes sense. And the fact that the dating methods don't work and they all have problems, there's nothing that contradicts the biblical history. Of course, then people say to me, okay, okay, if this is true, you tell me then, what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, I think that's pretty simple. I think they died. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that right? They died. Now, Evolutionists have over a hundred theories as to why they died. You know, maybe hit by meteorites, or some of them think that a, an asteroid hit them, or maybe they ate an American hamburger and had problems, or maybe like most of us, they overate 
Some of them probably went on one of those diets you see on TV. Some think they <laughs> died of starvation. Some people think there was just too much smoke on the earth and uh, that's what happened to them. <laughs> but <laughs> let that be a warning to you, by the way. <laughs> but as I say to people, look, it's not a mystery. I was just over in Glasgow in Scotland, went to the science centre there and they had a little display and took a photograph of it for you which says here's the species of animals may, and, and plants made extinct since January 2000. We called up the Cincinnati Zoo and you know what the scientists there said? At least seven species become extinct per day. Now species is not a kind, you understand that, but at least seven species become extinct per day of animals they say. You see, here's my point. We have endangered species programs. Why? Because extinction is the rule. Animals become extinct every day. And, you know, people come to me and say, well, what happened to the dinosaurs? I say, why aren't you just in all the other animals that have died out? Why, why is it just the dinosaurs you're worried about? It's because we're influenced by millions of years in evolution, that's why. But you see, if you start thinking about it, we have endangered species programs because we're losing animals, they're dying out every day. If you said to uh, a scientist, why do we have endangered species programs? You know what they'll say? Why? Well, it's obvious. Animals dying out every day, animals becoming extinct, we're trying to save the animals. And, and, and plants, oh, there's only a few of this left in the wild, there's only a couple of these in captivity, ah. Oh. Why do animals become extinct? Why? Everyone knows people killing them, clearing land diseases, genetic mistakes, catastrophes, all sorts of reasons. Oh, what happened to the dinosaurs? We don't know. <laughs> See, here's, here's what we need to do. If you put the dinosaurs with Adam on day six, sin affected the world, the curse affected the world, the flood affected the world, Noah's Ark lands in the Middle East, animals start splitting up, the gene pool splits up as well and gets diluted as animals move all over the world and you get different species and so on, they're more susceptible to diseases and competition and animals start dying out because the climate changes after the flood which it's been doing ever since the flood, lots of animals become extinct, the dinosaurs have become extinct but they live beside people up until hundreds of years ago, that's why we have their dragon legends and here we are today and it looks like there's none left and tell me what's the problem. It's only a problem if you believe in millions of years or you believe in evolution. You know in Australia in 1994 scientists got a shock. They found a tree called a Wallamai pine tree which they thought existed nowhere in the world. They've only found it in the fossil record at the time of the dinosaurs according to evolutionists. Now 140 million years ago supposedly. Now think about this carefully. If I had of, before 1994, said to an evolutionist, I believe the wild my pine tree lived with people. They would say, ha, oh, that's ridiculous. That became extinct with the dinosaurs 140 million years ago. Suddenly they find it living in the Blue Mountains in Sydney for the first time in our modern world in 1994. And you know what one scientist in Australia said? This would be no different to finding a living dinosaur. They call it the dinosaur tree. Do you, do you see what I'm saying there? People scoff at me for believing dinosaurs live with people. But, the, but the, the dinosaur tree, the Wallamai pine tree, supposedly didn't live with people. They, they would have scoffed at me for that. And suddenly they find it living and they say, oh, well, it's a living fossil. That's when fossils aren't dead. Friends, what I'm saying to us is this. When you put on the glasses of secular history, it doesn't make sense of dinosaurs. Real science doesn't support it. There's a lot of problems. When you put on biblical glasses, we can explain dinosaurs. The fossils. The Wallamai pine tree. <laughs> and so it goes on. Actually, you know what I call dinosaurs? I call dinosaurs missionary lizards. <laughs> I remember a time I went to church and the pastor said, what are you going to preach on this morning? I said, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. He said, I want you to preach the gospel. I said, I will. <laughs> How can you do that using dinosaurs? I said, you don't understand. I'm not fitting dinosaurs into the Bible. I'm using the, dino the Bible to explain dinosaurs. And when you do that, you start talking about dinosaur bones and you know they're dead. Isn't that right? And you're reminded, death, yes, death came into the world because of? Ah, oh, because of sin. Exactly. So then you can start talking about the wages of sin is death. You can talk about Adam and Eve and so on. And then we're reminded that all have sinned. Why? See, there's no one innocent. All have sinned because we're all descendants of Adam. We sinned in Adam. So we're alienated from God. We can't live with a holy God. That's why God sent his son. He loved us so much. See, there's our God of love. Where's our God of love in the midst of September 11th? Where's our God of love in the midst of tragedy every day? You know where our God of love is? Even though we told God we didn't want him and we live in a world that we wanted, he said, but I want you. And he stepped into history in the person of Jesus Christ to suffer the curse of death on a cross to save us. Wow, there's our God of love in the midst of tragedy. Wow, there's our God of love in the midst of the tragedy of my brother. Knowing that 
He's saved for eternity. That's the most important thing. Because we're all going to die one day anyway. He's just going to face it a little earlier than some of us, that's all. But a lot, of, a lot of people have gone before anyway. You see, Romans 5, Paul reminds us that Christ died for us. And Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You know why I'm in the Answers in Genesis ministry? Not to convince people of creation, but to convince people of the creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's, there's no point convincing people of creation unless they trust in the creator because creationists then will go to hell like anyone else if they don't believe and trust in the creator. And that's why we do what we do. And I pray that everyone in this room and everyone watching these programs can say that they have knelt before the cross of Calvary, that they have trusted the Lord Jesus, believed in their heart God has raised him from the dead so we can be saved, that we're in that ark of salvation. And then when we are, as John said, then you know that you have eternal life. No one can take it away from you. You are saved for eternity. Be with the Lord for eternity. Well, you know, dinosaurs are probably used more than anything to convince children today and mums and dads the Bible's not true. You know, you think of Jurassic Ark and Lost World and so on. How important it is that we have information out there. And a lot of people think you can't trust the Bible. It's got nothing to do with dinosaurs and dinosaurs disprove the Bible. Hey, our website has a ton of information. And again, we have a newsletter that teaches you as well, encourage you to get hold of that. We give you a free CD. Brand new book of mine. Uh, well, well, this one is, is an older book, The Great Dinosaur Mystery Solved, that covers everything I did today in much more detail. But a brand new book of mine is this one, Dinosaurs of Eden. Teaches the gospel using dinosaurs as missionary lizards. It's for the whole family, the whole history of the world, from creation through consummation. And the Answers book has a, a chapter dealing with dinosaurs. Ideas for Dinosaur, great book for children. And by the way, most of these are in that big pack of books, including this video on dinosaurs, the ex-Nilo show.